We have a, uh, today's a talk by someone who's currently local, in the sense that he's he is and has been for now some almost two years. Yeah. The I'm going to get this wrong. Marie Curie. No, it's the doctor. Yeah, and it's a it's an EU fellowship it's given to scholars to come to the United States and work at the American University uh, in the aim of building relationships between American and European EU universities, which is nice. But we're the beneficiaries, so no, no complaining. At least I'm not uh, Dr. Mohammed Ali Adroui is a French political scientist working in contemporary international relations and contemporary Islam. He holds a PhD from the Sciences Po in Paris for his work on contemporary Salafism. He's uh, uh, right now working on a pro project. I mean, it's kind of usually when we have people from Europe or basically pretty much anywhere else in the world, they're here to talk to us about their parts of the world, but actually here He's here to talk to us about his current project, which is about our part of the world, namely the United States and political Islam dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the Arab Revolution. Um, he's also held academic positions at the European University Institute in Florence and National University of Singapore. That's why you're asking me about Singapore. I remember now. And uh, his book on Salafism in France is currently under contract with Oxford University Press. He's also edited a volume on Islamist movements, foreign policies, published by Edinburgh University Press which he nicely gave me a copy of, which I enjoyed. So he's here to talk about his current project, and then we'll have lots of questions and comments. Hopefully. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm extremely honored to be here in order to tell you sorry, about my current research, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying thank you, Jonathan, for hosting me here and being in such incredible institution for my research at the Christian Muslim Understanding Center. It's an honor to be here at Georgetown with such exciting people and that I can talk to every day almost. Thanks to people like Shirin, and like Robert, like uh, Andrew. Uh, and this research is also, I mean, um, I'm in depth with Mushan Esposito, Professor Esposito, who, is, who has been supervising this current research dealing with how the U.S. has been seeing and has been framing and has been interacting with the people we call, the, we call themselves the Muslim brothers, especially in Egypt. So uh, this presentation is part of an ongoing research that I am currently conducting here at the School of Foreign Service and dealing mainly with two things. A historical investigation on the U.S. diplomatic archives related to U.S. Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood relations for one century. And then a more contemporary approach dedicated to studying how the U.S. has tried to find the finest tuning towards the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt especially when this movement achieved a huge, huge electoral success success a few years ago and seized power at the head of the Egyptian state before they were overthrown when the military, military coup occurred in July 2013. What makes this research original, at least hopeful, uh, hopefully according to me, uh, well, as a political scientist and a historian of international relations, this research is original in three ways. First, it is an interaction, or what I'm studying, I've been studying, has to do with a sort of interaction between a traditional state seeking to defend its interests and a religious and political actor coupling itself towards the Muslim world scale. Second, the Muslim Brotherhood is a movement whose political ethics overtly aim to reverse the structures of this international <coughs> I'll give you just a very brief example. For instance, in 2010, over a weekly sermon called How Islam Confronts the Oppression and Tyranny Against the Muslims, Mohammed Badia suffering today a life sentence in prison after he was arrested in August 2013 uh, after the coup, described the United States as a country that is easy to defeat through violence since it represents a power, in quotes, experiencing the beginning of its end and this power is heading towards its demise. The Islamist leader actually went even further by claiming that, in quote again, resistance is the only solution against the Zio American urban tyranny. And third point, third interest, the double dimension of the Islamist political party's identity and platform, effectively despite, despite its status as a transnational movement, Islamism and its followers, 
especially the Egyptian Muslim robbers, seek to exercise power by taking position at the head of one given state. So my aim is to assess how the people in charge have framed and understood political Islam through their public declarations, but while also focusing on the intellectual, academic, and strategic debates that have been influencing the stances taken by U.S. leaders and diplomats when it comes to the Islamist issue. U.S. leaders and diplomats have attempted to, to bring Islamist leaders to a common field based upon shared conception of what an acceptable policy is, of course, in the U.S. understanding of it. To do so, they have used moral incentives, in particular, such as oral compliments, but also criticism or warning symbolizing the aim to channel the brotherhood's possible antagonism against the U.S. Historically, the U.S. administration has constantly balanced between two stances from a historical perspective. Fear of the radical part of the Islamist ideology, uh, and confidence in seeing, in seeing it become moderate, especially in the wake of debates seen in academic and policy-oriented research fields. According to the decisions made by the Islamist leadership, one trend seems to have overtaken another in the discursive part of what I would call the taming process of the U.S. Oral attempts to establish some rules of the game are indeed based on years of debates and discussions on the nature of political Islam, especially its capacity of generating moderate, according to US expectations, of course, stances. So having to deal with the brotherhood at the end of the biggest Arab state was not necessarily enjoyed. But the US leadership progressively removed on to what I would call an open-the-door policy, making it possible to question their attempt to set up a modus vivendi with a force seeking originally to get rid of US primacy in the region. That's my main point. So these are basically the key questions that I'm going to address. Uh, my research is interdisciplinary. Um, I use different tools, uh, historical investigation, intensive use of the past, I'm going to tell you more about that, and more contemporary international relations approach with interviews, reports, reports sorry, and discourse analysis. So these two questions are, first of all, how the US has been interpreting, sorry, Interpreting <laughs> and framing the notion of ideology and political as well as religious Islamism. <coughs> and the second question is how to socialize or to tame its anti US potential. The first thing is I've been working for now almost two years on the US State Department archives. And what can I say about this? What do the archives teach us in terms of uh, what the US diplomats have been saying about the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt? So this is as far as I, as, I, as I have seen the first report made about the Muslim Brotherhood um, by the U.S. Diplomat, diplomats who were based in Cairo uh, at the U.S. Embassy there. And this first report, you know, dates back 1944. And that's, in my view at least, and all the colleagues who are working on this issue they seem to agree and seem to be okay with that, the idea that the first report was made in 1944. And we know that the Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 19... 27 or 28. Which is extremely funny here is that you can see that, I mean, <coughs> well, trust me, I'm going to, to read what I really have to, to look at here. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded according to the first U.S. diplomats who were in Cairo at that time in 1938. So even the foundation date was not the right one. And the idea, yes, 10 years in state. So the idea that we need to wait until 1944 to have the first report dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood is extremely interesting because for years and years it means that this issue was almost inexistent for the U.S. diplomats. So how can they, what can we say, can we, can we, can we, can we draw in terms of lessons? The Ikhwan, so the brothers, they are a danger. So here, I'm focusing on the last paragraph. The danger of the Ikhwan is the fanatical principles which it professes, and according to the Brotherhood, in as much as Egypt is a Muslim state, and it should be governed by Quranic law. Uh, everything non-Muslim should be detested. So it is a fanatical and possibly a violent movement. The context in which this report was made has to do with two things. The first of all, it is extremely interesting and extremely um, I mean, fascinating to a large extent because there was a letter sent by the Muslim Brothers leaders at that time to the US ambassador saying two things basically. That the US as a democratic country should pressure countries colonial powers in Europe like France and Britain, because we know that at that time France, for example, and Britain were extremely powerful in terms of colonial I mean, uh, 
to the colonial powers, and the U.S. was requested to put some pressure on their allies in order, you know, to facilitate the liberation of a country like Algeria, or even a country like here, Egypt, obviously, because Egypt was the real ruler of Egypt. Um, uh, sorry, Britain was the real ruler of Egypt even after the so-called official independence in 1922. We are in the 40s and the British are still ruling the country. That's the first thing. The second thing is the question of Palestine. So here are the two first paragraphs. The idea that at that time we have an ongoing colonization process in Palestine is extremely important to the Muslim brothers. And once again, the U.S. ambassador and of course all the, the major, the high-profile diplomats, they were very, let's say, um, put pressure on, you know, and they wanted, you know, they were asked you know, to put some pressure on the Zionist um, movement in Palestine at that time. So we can see from the beginning, at least in the U.S. perspective, that the anti-colonial, I mean, approach is a key parameter in the way uh, political Islam was framed. And if you like um, historical anecdotes, for the very first time, because the letter was written in Arabic, there was no person uh, who was fluent in Arabic at that time in the embassy. And for the very first time, when they, somebody was hired speaking Arabic, it was due to this letter, because there was nobody to translate the piece. A few years later, so this is another piece here, we are in 1952, so a few months after the, um, the, um, the military coup, the Dobat al-Ahrar, uh, the coup uh, undertaken by the, the free office, I mean the free, um, high, uh, free military uh, in Egypt, in 1952, we are a few years after the first report, and the idea here that you can clearly see, I'm going to quote some, 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 some paragraphs, the idea that the Muslim government can be, in this context, some partners for the U.S. leadership is a key, key component. So the Cold War had, had started, obviously. Um, the military regime is much closer to the Soviet Union uh, than it used, than, for example, the monarchy used to be, uh, much closer to Britain and, of course, the U.S., and the idea that the Muslim brothers could be used or could be, um, they could be partners, they could be uh, possible allies uh, in the U.S. I mean, interest is extremely important from, let's say, 1952 onwards. For example, here you have a report dealing with an interview made by the chargé d'affaires at that time, uh, Frank Gaffney, uh, and he used to talk quite frequently on a frequently basis to the leaders at that time. So the leader at that time is Hassan al Budaibi. Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, was killed, assassinated in October 1949. And you have here the reports and what he said, I mean, the topics that were um, tackled uh, in these discussions. And we have here, I mean, the proof, the evidence that um, the main leaders were, let's say, partners, but they were at that time, I mean, um, uh, there used to be a discussion, an open channel discussion. We have people like Saeed Ramadan, you know him? The father of Tariq Ramadan? Uh, Mahmoud Mahlouf, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mahmoud Mahlouf, and uh, here it's uh, Robert Macklin, uh, which is the Chancellor of the Embassy, who was um, involved in this discussion. So who is the charge of the affair? Frank Gaffney. Frank Gaffney? Yes, I know. Same name, the any same relation name. to the current uh, guy? Thing? Absolutely. That's one of them. That is terrible. That's completely crazy. I know. So the idea here that the brothers are no longer described, you know, considered to be a fanatical movement is extremely important. And for example, but maybe it's too small, but I'm going to give you two or three main ideas. Here the questions that are tackled by the U.S. diplomats are this type of questions. Are you pro-free market economy? What would, you, what would you do, I mean, if you, one day you come to power? Uh, would you be able, you know, to work with the U.S.? Could you be basically our partners? That's the main idea. Are you in favor of the values we have? being defending. Uh, and of course you have the response here uh, made by the guy, by Hudebi and his, and, his, and his friends, the idea, for example, I, mean, I asked the Supreme Guy what attitude his group took with respect to the future form of government in Egypt. Okay? He said the Ikhwan, so the brothers, wanted the government to be founded on Quran Quranic lines. <coughs> I asked, so the, the US diplomat, if this would mean doing away with the banking system and the elimination of interest, the riba, you know that? And he said that under the Quran, a way could be found to maintain banks, but that he would prefer, if possible, to abolish interest, because it's forbidden in their, in their understanding. When I explained the difficulty which would ensue if Egypt were to get foreign capital in the form of loans, the Supreme Guy, so the baby, confessed that this was a valid point and said that the Quran would permit, in <coughs> cases of necessity, a less strict interpretation of the Prophet's ban on interest. So, I mean, the partnership started to get 
more, I mean, uh, more and more evident, more and more obvious. The when you study the archives, there is a huge problem. And by the way, I forgot to mention one very important thing: that it's an ongoing research, so I still have some gaps to fill, unfortunately. Well, I I have collected a pretty reasonable amount of archives, you know, until the 60s and the 70s, which is basically because if I want to summarize the type of relationship between the U.S. on the one hand and the brothers on the other hand, is the fact that through, I mean, um, as much as Nasser, for example, is seen as close to the Soviet Union, you know, the Suez Crisis, uh, the 60s, the Six Day Wars, and, and so on and so forth, uh, the brothers are seen, you know, it's like, you know, you have a reverse uh, correlation, and the brothers are seen and framed as a potential ally, and the idea, for example, that they are, the word used to be in there in this regard, a, initially they were seen as a fanatical and radical movement, uh, it tends to disappear, uh, I mean, at the benefit of being more moderate and being seen as possible partners and allies uh, when it comes to challenging, you know, the, um, at that time, uh, uh, Nasser's rule. I have a problem here because when it comes to the 80s, or let's say after, uh, after the late 70s onwards, the archives are no longer declassified. So I have written to the U.S. State Department, and it takes months or maybe years in order you know, to get their approval. So unfortunately, what I have here, or fortunately it depends, the idea here is that I mainly collect my information by interviewing people. So what I can say, for example, is that the early 80s is extremely important because for the very first time, at least from a Western perspective, for the very first time we have a public assassination in 1981 of the Egyptian president, Anwar al-Sadat, and at that time we know, for, for the very first time, we have a mention to a religious extremist ideology. Which is interesting because today it seems quite obvious that at that time when I mentioned in my interviews with some U.S. diplomats who were in charge, uh, for example, um, in the Bureau of Near, East of Near Eastern Affairs uh, at the State Department, they clearly confessed actually that there was no real interest you know, for these radical extremist political ideologies and one who was extremely I mean, uh, important, at least at that time, he was a high profile person, he said that it was still the Cold War framework that was dictating U.S. diplomats and what they have to believe in terms of uh, political beliefs. And what a very, another anecdote is extremely interesting because even the assassination of Anwar and Sadat was seen as a conspiracy or the result of a plot from the Soviet Empire, the Soviet Union. And the Jamaat, the groups, the Islamic groups in charge or responsible or guilty for killing Sadat, they were seen at that time in the early 80s as possibly connected to the Soviet Union. I mean, they was no independent, let's say, Islamist action outside of the framework of the Cold War framework. So, um, let me move back now to the early 90s, which is a turning point. Um, this man here is Edward Cherigian. He was uh, an extremely influential person. He's an, he was an ambassador. He's now uh, more or less a scholar at, the, um, at Rice University. He's the director of the Baker's Institute. He's extremely knowledgeable in the field of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East for not for years but for decades, and he's the very first one, let's say, who established you know a sort of doctrine or official position, U.S. position, when it comes to the idea of dealing or not dealing with some religious actors, radical extremist actors. I don't know if some of you have ever heard of this famous speech, the Meridian House speech, June 2nd of June 1992. For the very first time, we are now pretty sure that the Cold War is no longer relevant. We are pretty sure now that I mean, there is no such thing as a huge global strategic threat um, I mean, connected to the Russian influence. At least that's what they believed at that time uh, at the State Department. And maybe for the very first time at this high level, the notion or the rise or the threat uh, caused by a religious extremism connected to Islam is put into work. At that time, 1989-1991, uh, we, uh, we should remember that the Algerian crisis was a paramount experience, and for the very first time in the Arab countries, we had a such huge success generated by the Islamist engagement into classical politics with the FIS, or Islamic Muslim, in English, the Front for the Islamic Salvation. And for the very first time, well, we have somebody wondering at this level here in the U.S., who was the assist at that time the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. And so, uh, June 1992, 
he pronounced a famous speech called the Meridian House speech, not far from here, in which this is basically what he argued. The religion, Islam in this case, is not necessarily a determinant, positive or negative thing, you know, in the nature or quality of our relations with other countries. Our quarrel is with extremism and the violence, denial, intolerance, intimidation, coercion, and terror which too often accompany it. Okay? Uh, so he mentions the fact that the role of religion in the Middle East has become more manifest and much attention is being paid to a phenomenon variously labeled political Islam. The Islamic revival or Islamic fundamentalism. He praised Islam as, in quote, as one of the world's great faith, while noting that its cultural legacy is a rich one in the science, arts, and culture and intolerance of Judaism and Christianity. The region then analyzed the Islamist movement in countries throughout the Middle East and North Africa. That's what he said. He said, we see groups or movements seeking to reform their societies in keeping with Islamic ideals. There is conser uh, considerable diversity in how these ideals are expressed. We detect no monolithic or co uh, coordinated international effort behind this movement. That diversity is fine, he went on so long as there, there is a real political dialogue between government on the one hand and the people and parties and other institutions on the other. Those who are prepared to take specific steps towards free election, creating independent, uh, independent judiciaries, promoting the rule of law, reducing restrictions on the press, respecting the rights, the rights of minorities, and warranting individual rights, will find us ready to recognize and support their efforts just as those moving in the opposite direction will find us ready to speak candidly and act accordingly. Those who seek to broaden political participation in the Middle East will therefore find us supporting, as we have been elsewhere in the world. So indeed, Washington has good productive relations with countries and peoples of all religions throughout the world, <coughs> including many whose system of government are firmly grounded in Islamic principles, but the U.S. government is suspect of those who would use the democratic process to come to power only to destroy that very process in order to retain power and political dominance. While we believe in the principle of one person, one vote, we do not support one person, one vote, one vote, one time. Clear reference to Algeria at that time. There was a coup. There was a coup because the Islamist movement had won but people were afraid of what? That this movement would use politics in order to stay to power. So one man, one vote, one time. Jerigian then um, adduced the general rule that the concern is political, not religious. In his words, once again in quotes, religion is not determinant, positive or negative, as I told you, which leads to the takeaway quote of the speech, which is, the US government does not view Islam as the next ism, ISM, confronting the West or threatening world peace. That is an overly simplistic response to a complex reality. The Cold War is not being replaced with a new competition between Islam and the West. So here, what is extremely fascinating according to me, what we can see, it seems to be a dual appreciation of what contemporary politics in the Islamic world can be, uh, from a US perspective, of course. We can here indeed get two types of interpretation of such a speech. There is nothing like an ism communism, Stalinism, Nazism, whatever. But in the same time, for the very first time at the highest political and diplomatic level in the US leadership, a new possible threat is clearly acknowledged and framed in such words, such words, sorry, that certain people may feel entitled to identify a paradigm shift in the US global strategy. Um, <coughs> this policy actually was, let's say, more or less put into practice and another turning point you know, happened you know, in September 11, 2001. So the idea that this religious extremism could generate a new ism you know, was once again put under the table. Uh, and the, let's say, fearing the Islamist approach, we will call it. So drawing largely on the contacts made with the opponents of regimes seen as conciliatory or even as allies of the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War, American diplomacy has, at least since that time, try to understand and work with actors, group and groups and movements from the brothers matrix at that time. Because, I will tell you why, this also applies to, of course, non-Sunni Islamists, for example, in other countries, since their importance is real in Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern politics. 
the distinctive feature of the American position is surely its consciousness of the fundamentalist character of the Islamist offer. However, different administrations having succeeded in contemporary times have swung between two positions, actually more theoretical than practical, with regard sorry, with regards to the Islamist question. For instance, in 2006, George Bush Jr. was questioned by the political participation of the Lebanese Hezbollah in this country, I mean, uh, in Lebanon, of course. And he, rep he replied the following, I like the idea of people running for office. There's a positive effect. Maybe some will run for office and say, vote for me, I, will, I look forward to blowing up America, but I don't think so. I think people who generally run for office say, vote for me, I'm looking forward to fixing your tough holes. Barack Obama publicly said that he was suspicious regarding the father movement of political Islam, the Muslim Brothers, namely the Muslim Brothers, describing them as untrustworthy, harboring anti-American views, and probably not honoring the Camp David peace treaty with Israel. Although political, this debate undoubtedly had deep ramification for the intellectual and academic field. In fact, for example, the think tanks, which are generally considered centrist, to be centrist, have in recent years distinguished themselves from the position expressed above by the last two US presidents. While, for example, emphasizing the radical nature of Islamist ideology, those think tanks have not denied development opportunities. And in particular, the hypothesis of a more democratic political, ga political game, sorry, in which different political forces would be able to express their opinions. <coughs> So this is especially true of many reports from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Brooklyn Center, while other institutions such as, such as, for example, the Rand Corporation and the National Research Defense Institute are characterized by a higher degree of mistrust towards the Muslim brothers. This institution, for example, has in reality produced some analysts that were close to, the, to some centrist views, as well as a more essentialist studies about the Islamic fact and Islamist question. I'll give you an example. <coughs> In Cheryl Bernard's report, uh, the question of democratization within Muslim-majority societies is tied to, to the question of secularization, such that actors who claim a religious identity cannot be considered as privileged partners. It is no surprise that, according to this view, factors explaining the absence of democratization in Muslim countries are generally related to religion and highlight that only a specific way of dealing with Islam in the public and sometimes private sphere is likely to generate a democratization process. The solution, <coughs> basically, lie in a major religious reform. Either, even more fundamentally, this study draws a typology of Muslims in the world, uh, dividing them between secularists, traditionalists, modernists, and fundamentalists. Put in the fundamentalist category, the Muslim brothers are not only analyzed as less compatible with democracy, but also closer to jihadist and terrorist organizations such, <coughs> such as Al-Qaeda than moderate actors. Then the author, the author sorry, argues that there is an ideological and political continuum unifying all the proponents of the radical and political form of Islam. The problem of committing uh, to a conscious policy towards Islam is consequently oscillates between an assumed reality principle and the search for the most suitable strategy to deal with the anti-status quo potential included in the Islamist, Islamist ideology. So this debate, for example, at that time, echoes great, uh, echoes, sorry, great fractures in academia because for some people it is an Orientalist tradition that refers to the one that had, that had emerged in Europe centuries ago. Uh, creating multiple discrepancies regarding the interpretation of both Islamic and Islamist facts. This happened at a time when the United States was taking over the traditional powers from the other side of the Atlantic, while Islamism was become one of the major angles of analysis on, of the contemporary Muslim world. Influencing policymakers, these various approaches of radical Islam have been convened to justify certain military and diplomatic strategies in the Middle East as providing several of the key frameworks through which the Islamist issue has been interpreted. 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 These considerations have moreover illustrated the specific comprehension of U.S. Foreign, foreign policy in the Muslim world, starting with the Middle East. Indeed, to a large extent, the assumption that political Islam could or could not be reformed to become a religious democratic force in the region is clearly connected to those debates on the nature of Islam. Opposing understandings of what U.S. foreign policy should be in this part of the world, 
uh, have been uh, effectively being discussed since the appearance of Islamism as a major player in most Muslim countries. Some policymakers and academics have, for instance, argued that a significant change in U.S. policy in the region would be necessary in order to shape a new landscape that would encourage religious actors to become more moderate. And others have, to the contrary, insisted on the primary essential issue that was Islam's conceptions of politics, uh, minimizing in doing so the role of the U.S. diplomacy and the U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. So now, when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, here a bit of theory that I use in my work, what we call constructivism. And why I want to talk to you about constructivism, it's because the Muslim Brotherhood have been a target of this commitment policy with Obama. So the second, uh, the second part. Um, so while some argue that they are likely to be integrated into the political game, others underline that they seek to harm U.S. interests in the region that is key for its safety. Until the revolution, uh, the Arab Spring, the policy which prevailed was that of uh, an opposition to Hosni's Mubarak's regime, at least according to some people, and it appears that the last years of the regime in Egypt generated much debate over its sustain sustainability, and therefore also much debate regarding the position to be taken towards the actors likely to challenge that power. This must be situation, situated sorry, within a broader consideration of the necessary democratization of the states in the region, the Bush years were, for instance, characterized by the establishment of a democratic push, you know, the famous Grand or Great Middle East, that also included the Islamist forces in the countries where diplomacy was chosen over military intervention. Assuming that Islamism represented a potential ally against the systematically violent transnational jihadists, the Bush, uh, the Bush administration promoted a real diplomacy of the opposition that continues to rely on Mubarak's regime, for example. Uh, but with Obama, the huge change, the major change, was that um, he decided to adopt a new policy. I'm going to tell you more about that right now. He pursued a, let's say, pretty different strategy. The time had come to question the foundation on which American foreign policy in the region was built. The highest U.S. authorities began to consider redefining the links with, between the U.S. and undemocratic states. And even before the beginning of the Arab, Arab Spring, why? perpetuating the structures of the alliance with Egypt, supporting the sovereign right of the people in the Arab world to choose their, choose, sorry, their political elites in this speech in Cairo on June uh, 4, uh, 2009, President Obama pursued his thinking in August 2010 with a note of five pages addressed to his, to his highest advisors, entitled, Political Reform in the Middle East and North Africa, the central argument of Obama's note is the need to stop believing that stability in the region comes from the support of autocratic regimes, and that American interests benefit from the absence of representative government. Meanwhile, for instance, at that time, Margaret Scobie, the US ambassador in Cairo, said in 2009 that, in quote, despite incessant whispery discussions, no one in Egypt has any certainty about who will eventually succeed Mubarak, nor under what circumstances. Then, with Obama, one of the major, uh, let's say, changes in the way the U.S. State Department has been framing this issue of the Muslim Brothers has to do with the Queen Mecham Working Group. I don't know if you're aware of this working group within the policy staff units, which is basically the think tank within the, the U.S. State Department. So this, for the first time, at this level, you know, the issue of political Islam was explicitly addressed. Queen Mecham is very interesting because I had an interview with him, you know, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. He's a professor at Brigham Young University, and he's a special, specialist of political Islam and international relations. Um, and he was the one leading this working group called Gulf Affairs, Political Islam, and Global Religious Affairs. And he said to me when I met with him, you know, a few weeks, a month ago, he said that the idea of including political Islam in his portfolio was clearly connected to his profile. There was no interest at that time or explicit interest you know, for political Islam as a topic of concern for the U.S. State Department. The idea of the work of the Queen Mekham Working Group was basically two things. We are in 2008, 2009, 2010, so a bit, after, a bit before prior to the revolution. The idea is two things. To collect, first of all, the most in, as much uh, empirical uh, material when it comes to the Islamist parties anywhere in the Arab and outside the Arab world, first of all, and so to build 
build up a strong, let's say, uh, databases when it comes to the Islamist affairs, first things. And second thing, you know, try to find out if the, wherever it's possible, what can be, what the commonalities between the US and the Islamist can be. For example, are they aware of, or are they, let's say, um, likely, for example, to respect the minorities' rights or the women's rights? Or would they go for, let's say, one man, one vote, one time policy and they seize power one day? So the idea was to build up, you know, the biggest, uh, for the U.S. diplomat, the biggest, you know, uh, databases um, that we could, uh, in a U.S. perspective, you know, build um, a policy upon. So the month of January and February 2011 saw the power of Mubarak falter, before which he had left in power a board of directors composed of soldiers, of course, we know that. In the wake of the Tunisian revolution, many Egyptians expressed their desire to see the rise of President leave. In the early days of the protest movement, which was physically crystallized by hundreds of thousands of people converging on the Tahrir Square, the famous square in Cairo, U.S. officials were primarily concerned about the situation of the president. Yet, the question of the Muslim brothers quickly became central, as the need for Mubarak's departure was confirmed. It is in this context that Hillary Clinton, the state secretary at that time, she said in the first days of the demonstrations that it's not America that put people into the streets of Tunis and Cairo adding that these revolutions are not ours. They are not by us, for us, or, for us, or against us. Uh, before noting that the government in place was able to answer to the people's <coughs> aspirations. However, the evaluation of the situation quickly changed, so has to leave room for serious concern if the power did not listen to the revolutionary aspirations. There were also concerns about the political situation that could result from a redistribution of power at the highest level of the Egyptian state. Hence, the first references to the Muslim robbers were made, reactivating the dual analysis that they had inspired at the highest level of U.S. leadership for many years. Faced with the amplification of the protest movement, the official U.S. position that had until, be, uh, that had until then been a call to the Egyptian authorities began to converge on the single issue of the president. This is well illustrated by the man who would become Secretary of State after the departure of Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, who stated that it was time for a critique of U.S. policy towards Egypt. In the opinions pages uh, of the New York Times, in January 31, 2011, that's what John Kerry warns about. Given the events of the past week, some are criticizing America's past tolerance of the Egyptian regime. It is true that our public rhetoric did not always match our private concerns. But there are there also was a pragmatic understanding that our relationship benefited American foreign policy and promoted peace in the region. Our interests are not served by watching friendly governments collapse under the weight of the anger and frustration of their own people, nor by transferring power to radical groups that would spread extremism. For three decades, the United States pursued a Mubarak policy. Now we must look beyond the Mubarak era and devise an Egyptian policy. The conditions regarding the departure of Hosni Mubarak and more specifically the role of the United States are still being debated, of course. At the same time, increasing references made to the main Egyptian Islamist movement characterized the content of the US officials' talks. These speeches were effectively increasingly insisting on the need for a change of leadership or even of regime and less and less on the need for simple reforms. Even though some voices could still be heard during the month of March and April 2011 to warn against the possible rise to power of the Muslim Brothers and leaders, as the political transition progresses, started to explicitly open the door to the Muslim Brothers. In fact, between spring and autumn 2011, Hillary Clinton would have had many opportunities to echo the need to deal with the Muslim Brothers. Recognizing that the reasons of the American foreign policy towards certain states in the region should be subject to criticism. For example, this is when several senior diplomats of the State Department, <coughs> the Pentagon, officially said that they were, in quotes, encouraging conversation with an array of opposition leaders, including the Muslim Brotherhood. The um, official position of the Obama administration was eventually expressed clearly in June 2011 by Hillary Clinton during a visit to Budapest. This is what she said. We believe, given the changing political landscape in Egypt, that it is in the interest of the United States to engage with all parties that are peaceful and committed to non-violence, that intend to compete for the parliament and the presidency. And we welcome, therefore, dialogue with those Muslim Brotherhood members who wish to talk with us. 
and in November 2011, the Secretary of State reiterated this by comparing the opening up to the Egyptian Islamist uh, with the tra traditional sorry, support afforded to the systems in control, which could be the subject of criticism. Hillary Clinton again, for years, dictators told their people they had to accept the autocrat in view to avoid the extremist, the extremist they feared. Too often, we accepted that, that narrative ourselves. Uh, well, so I'm not, I'm not going to elaborate more on this theoretical framework. What I want you to keep in mind, please, is the fact that international relations rely a lot on discourse analysis. And the policy, I mean, if I want to put it theoretically, the policy adopted by the US <coughs> leadership was this one. More or less because of this reality principle, the brothers are probably going to win the elections and to seize power at the head of the Egyptian state. So what we need to do, basically, when it comes to our official discourses, is two things. We need to set up what we call in international relations theory the constitutive rules, and then try to implement some regulative rules. Speaking being the central activity, the, let's say, calculation made by the US leadership, US administration, was that by, by fixing, by setting, by establishing this framework, the Muslim brothers in power would have nothing to do but getting, getting moderate, more moderate. Uh, I'll give you um, a couple of examples. The idea that the Muslim Brotherhood potential, or I mean both moderation potential and revolutionary potential could be tamed is the key component of this policy. <coughs> the ideas, for example, that we had, let's say, um, three basic, let's say, frameworks that uh, the brothers had to keep in mind when it comes to dealing with the US. First of all, that's why I was mentioning the fact that there are some uh, constitutive rules and regulative rules. The constitutive rules are, for example, commitment to non-violent strategy. The Muslim Brotherhood should avoid being violent anytime, anywhere. The idea that the US wants to deal with a peaceful movement is the key component. First of all, you need to avoid explicitly any sort of or any type of violent strategy. What I call the Hobbesian framework. You know you see, it's a bit small, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher. So the security framework. First of all, the Muslim Brotherhood should not cause any security threat to the US, uh, to the US uh, United States. That's the first thing. The second regul uh, regulative rule, uh, sorry, constitutive rule is, or echoes to the French philosopher Rousseau. You need to commit yourself to a real democratic democratization process. You need to respect the popular sovereignty. If you go and come to power because of free elections, you need to understand that one day you will have to leave power because of free elections. The Rousseauist framework, after the Hobbesian framework. And the third one, it goes to the Locke's philosophy, John Locke's the philosopher. You need to keep in mind that you are going to be extremely cautious about making you respect the minorities' rights, the women's rights, especially the Christians and women. And so, as long as you are going to stick to this three components, we are going to be able to work with you. That's why we are mentioning in my work the existence of a constitutive rule scheme. Then, in terms of uh, regulative rules now, we have examples of, here for example, at, you know this person, Anne Patterson, on the right, the woman who is sitting next to the uh, former Muslim Brothers guy, Mohammed Badia, that, that I was mentioning in the introduction. Anne Patterson has met this, I mean, Mohamed Morsi, who, who is the president, who used to be the president, 32 times in one year and a half, over a one year and a half period. Uh, and she said to me when I, have, I met her a couple of times that my job to make clear that everything was, of course, permitted to uh, Mohamed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood leadership, as long as the Muslim Brotherhood leadership sticked, you know, to this framework. So, for example, I give you a very precise example. The conflict, the Gaza conflict, you know, in 20, um, uh, 2012, the idea of you know, what happens you know, in the Gaza Strip, you know, uh, quite frequently you know, in the last few years. The idea, for example, that the Muslim Brotherhood leadership and, of course, the Egyptian government, they should be a honest brokers between the Israelis and the Hamas, the Hamas being an Islamist Palestinian movement connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, as we know. Anne Patterson clearly, in her one of her most famous I mean, discourses, speeches, she said that Mohammed Morsi did a good job. He did well in connecting the Israelis, the services, the Israeli services, 
and the Hamas leadership, and that's why the conflict was less bloody, according to her, than it, should, it could have been. So this connection, you know, this uh, interaction between what we call constitutive rules and regulative rules is at the key, at the heart of the U.S. diplomacy, you know, towards the domestic brothers. And when I met, you know, uh, again, once again, you know, Ambassador Patterson here, she told me actually that Morsi did, for some aspects, she did, she did a good job. I mean, for example, he was free, a pro-free market economy. He was, he did nothing wrong when it came, for example, to um, making the situation between Hamas and Israel worse. He could have done, but he didn't. But she was much more skeptical about, for example, you know, the Muslim brothers' stances when it comes to women and Christians, the Copts, for example. She was, let's say, in between. Um, then, uh, the, uh, what can we draw in terms of lessons, you know, uh, when we study the connection, the historical connections between uh, the brotherhoods and, and the U.S.? So, as I told you, there is, first of all, a fear of the violent potential of the Muslim brothers. So, this pops in consideration. The brothers can be, can still be, I mean, to a large extent, in the eyes of many U.S. diplomats, they can be, or they can advocate for a violent strategy. And what the U.S. policy should be and should take care of is that this movement should always be under control. The idea that, I give you a very precise example, the idea, that's what the, Obama's advisor, what he told me, Dennis Ross, who is a professor here at Georgetown University, he told me that what is problematic when it comes to the Muslim brothers, they may reject the use of violence, but not as a principle, as a strategy. So for him, at least, it is something extremely problematic. So this debate is an ongoing debate and still refers you know, to some fears at the head of the, uh, any um, US administration. The idea, once again, that when they come to power, you know, they may use or they may manipulate you know, democracy in order to stay and to remain in power. I would say uh, now with the Arab revolutions, it's less and less the case because with Tunisia, for example, to some extent with Egypt because of the military coup, the idea that, for example, we don't have any example so far, it may change, but uh, for the US diplomats, there is no evidence uh, that the, the Islamists, if they are um, defeated, they uh, would stay in power. For example, it's uh, let's say it's not even it's not still a um, it has not you know been uh, empirically uh, I mean um, tasted. <coughs> and then the idea that when it comes to citizenship and minority rights, it's a more let's say um, gray zone because many diplomats, many U.S. diplomats, they think that brothers and Islamists, more generally speaking, are doing a pretty good job. For example, in Tunisia, but in the case, for example, of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, it's more problematic. Some people are, many people, the U.S. diplomats are clearly divided on this issue. For example, Mohamed Morsi has been seen and described you know, as a homeless broker, as somebody, I mean, who was a moderate guy when it comes to uh, <coughs> providing the same rights, I mean, to all the communities in Egypt. Some other people have been much more skeptical. So this idea, once again, that there is no Islamist policy, but a country-by-country -country policy is another key lesson that we have to draw when we study the U.S. brothers' connections. It's not about dealing with the Muslim brothers as such. It's dealing about the Muslim brothers at the head of one state or when they are in the opposition. So this clear, I mean, um, this extremely important point is clearly connected, you know, to some scholars like, for example, Queen Meccan, Peter Mendeville, I would say John Esposito here, the idea that there is no such thing as dealing with Islamism there is something relevant called with dealing with, in, at some point, in a very specific configuration, in a very specific situation, with some people with an Islamist narrative, and to try to find a modus commonality, a common ground with them. So, uh, in terms now of a more long-term, I mean, um, interpretation of this issue, throughout recent history, let's say for decades, or for almost now one year, there are some changes, uh, changes, sorry, and constants in the um, U.S. brothers, you know, connection or relationship. For example, if I go back to the first archives I was mentioning in the beginning of my presentation, can we say that what happened in 2011, 2012, 2013 is pretty different from what happened in the 60s and the 50s? Because it's always the same issue. These people, we know they are here, they are part of their societies, they are powerful, they are influential, they have some role to play. But what, how can we use it, or should we use it, in order you know, to tame them, to tame their, let's say, their dark side, let's use this word, you know, in our interest, as the U.S. people, U.S. diplomats, U.S. leaders, 
So this is still an ongoing question. And I'm not sure actually that what happened 50 or 60 years ago is pretty different from what happened you know, in the wake of the, Arab, in the aftermath of the Egyptian revolution. Uh, two final points, if you allow me now. So is it an issue, is it relevant? Because now, because it's no longer the Obama administration, but the Trump administration. Should the Muslim Brotherhood be labeled as a ter terrorist organization? Because this is the official position, for example, of many countries, starting with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, Egypt, with Sisi today. Sisi has clearly decided that this movement should be labeled as a very dangerous terrorist movement organization. Should the US do the same? Should be aligning with the, some Arabs' uh, authoritarian regimes' uh, positions? So we have a key role played by some countries. Israel is one of them, Egypt, some Gulf states, of course, and this is an ongoing debate. So last June, so a few months ago, there was a hearing, a public hearing at the, at the Congress, and some experts, of course, were, 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 were solicited, saying for most of them that today the U.S. can be considered, can, can go as far as considering the uh, Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, which is not the official position. We have lobbies, we have people today advocating for this position. We cannot say that with Trump there is a clear now position towards the Muslim Brothers because they are no longer, at least so far, at least, you know, temporarily, they are no longer a key player in Egypt because they are, some of them, they are dead, they are in prison, there was a coup, so you know the story. That's, but there is a debate. So, for example, Hamas, Hezbollah are considered and labeled as terrorist organizations. Should the Muslim Brothers be considered the same? And final point, I have uh, witnessed a very interesting thing is that the Muslim Brotherhood US connection or relations have generated over the last few years a sort of domestic issue or domestic debate here in the US. You know, the idea that the brothers are no longer a threat, you know, in Egypt only, but also here domestically. The idea, for example, that some Muslim brothers are advisors to Obama has become extremely important, you know, in, I mean, within some circles. The idea that it's no longer a state to foreign movement far away from here, uh, I mean, issue or topic, it's quite fascinating because now the Egyptian uh, Muslim Brothers question is clearly an American, has become, has turned into a clear, a clearly an American question. I presume you know these people, for example, I know a bit Rashad Hussein, who was pretty close to Barack Obama, which means that being an observant Muslim, and not condemning the Western brothers has made him, you know, a serious threat for the U.S. interest here domestically. Ibu Patel is a smiley. Sorry? Ibu Patel is a smiley. Who is a smiley? He is a smiley. He's a smiley. Oh, he's a smiley. He's, yeah, he's, uh, I'm not sure he can be a Muslim brother and a smiley. You can be a Muslim brother and sometimes not even a Muslim. You have Christians who are Muslim brothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that would be my final comment. Once again, it's an ongoing research, so I apologize if, the, if, this, is, if this is a bit frustrating for me because it's not, it's an unfinished research, but I'll be happy to have your comments and thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I, did, I had two uh, questions. One was, um, uh, I, I don't know how um, the perspectives of the uh, Islamist leaders and Muslim Brotherhood leaders uh, changed or evolved or reacted to this policy. I know that your topic is U.S. policy towards uh, Islamism, but I would like to hear something about their voices. And then secondly, um, I don't know if you have a, to bring this up to 2019, um, I know that probably um, you could write off Trump administration as, as being pro-CC and having a very, um, a very hostile stance towards Islam, political Islam and Muslim Brotherhood, but is there any nuance there or is it really as uh, clear-cut as it seems from the news? Go ahead, you're the speaker. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting questions. So, uh, first of all, um, John, yeah, the importance of the Jerry Gian speech, I agree with you, but all it's about, I mean, the question is how should we, or, yeah, how should we interpret this, this speech? Because now we know what the story was after in, in the 90s and after September 11, then the Arab uprisings, then the you know, more or less partnership between the U.S. and the brothers. So we know more than we used to know, of course, in the early 90s. Well, at that time, I met Ambassador Jerichian. He told me that 
that's what he said basically. My aim was never to warn anybody about the possible religious threat or let's say, uh, exclusively. I was warning the US public opinion, the US leadership, you know, about any sort of extremism. And the idea that some extremists can be religiously motivated was one of my points. Mm -hmm. Is he, I mean, is he, uh, was he trying to manipulate me? Because, I mean, uh, people have extensively written on his <laughs> speech. I don't know, but the idea was to say it's, it was never about religion. It was about the use, the political and sometimes military use of religion, you know, especially in these countries. But I had a close look to the speech, and it's clearly about religion. I mean, in my view, at least. So clearly, yeah. Yeah, I would say it, if you jump it back a step, yeah, in terms of his attitude, mm -hmm. that what he was doing in that speech was taking religion seriously. As opposed to taking religion as the tail end of a traditional society that was being that was being dis that was disappearing, and that's the difference. Uh, that he he might say it has no political relevance. It has political relevance. It's not violent. It's violent. We're against extremism. What he does not say in that speech is, but we don't have to worry because religion is disappearing. No, yeah, and, no. but, but that's the kind of stuff you would hear in the early 60s. We really don't have to worry about these guys because it's disappearing. I mean, having written my dissertation in the 1960s on the Islamic, on the Sufi movement, mm -hmm. the number of times, you know, well, why don't you do something that's really relevant, like looking at leftist radicalism? That's true. You know, and that, and that what, the fact that Jerijin talks about religion without saying it's traditional and disappearing is really the key turning point in that fundamental in that fundamental attitude conceptual framework you you are right because uh, what you're saying now because in my mind to I had an interview a few weeks ago with someone called Daniel Pipes yes oh, yeah, yes. we know him the name yeah, we know him. <laughs> no I mean, I mean I mean I'm here to study all the people I mean sure. all the people whose positions you know I mean it's like uh, regardless of uh, I mean regardless of anything. The idea is to say for him that he was a loner. He felt like he was a loner years, for years and years and years in decades. He told me that I was saying, so it was here, I mean, sure. no he was saying, okay, for years and years, I paid attention to warning people about the issue of radical Islam. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and he, he said to me that that's what he said, basically, in quotes. Uh, Raising concerns on the issue of political Islam was like today focusing on the Chilean foreign policy. That's what he said. Yeah, he said I mean, I was like somebody today who would study the foreign policy of Chile. Mm -hmm. he's, what, what time? What time period is he talking about? Like he's talking. He's talking. Set, I mean, uh, he, he and I are talking to, about this prior I mean, to September 11. Yeah, the, for the, him, the, turning, the dividing right. date is September 11. But he was he was trying to persuade people to take religion politically seriously Absolutely, in the 1970s mm -hmm. already. I mean, one of the real one of the he and I disagree on a lot of things. But back in the 70s, we were both trying to say you've got to take religion seriously. And if you're looking at Islam, don't just look at the Arabs. Look at the whole Islamic mm -hmm. world. That's true. Mm -hmm. And whether whether you know what that meant for policy was something really rather different between him and me, but what that meant for analysis of what you looked at. You looked at things like the Muslim Brotherhood and took them seriously. Absolutely. And the thing is, I mean, up to now, he's taking them very seriously. The idea that, for example, there could be no such thing as a moderate Islamist right. is one of his, let's say, uh, core beliefs, you know? The idea of, I, I, I mean, I was, my interview with him was like, uh, do you believe that, for example, in Turkey, they are more or less moderate? Say, no, they are, I mean, it was more than once, actually. But he, he seems to be sticking to the idea that when you are an Islamic fundamentalist, especially if you're engaged well, in... When you are Islamic, you are by definition going to be radical anyway, regardless well, of what you That's think. not what he said. I'm talking about what he said, too. Right. I mean, that's, uh, that's another, another, another <laughs> discussion. But you were right. The idea that, to put it, to put it, yeah, to put it briefly, the idea that religion, and especially Islam, does matter, it's a shift. I mean, I mean, probably you're right, I agree with you, the Jirijian speech was, it, it was linked, you know, tied to, I mean, to some clear, I mean, empirical, I mean, uh, events, like Algeria, Algeria is really important. And Afghanistan. 
Uh, Afghanistan, thank you, sir, for your, for your question. The U.S. involvement. For the, yes, but the thing is that Afghanistan was a was never described by some people. I, I refer to, for example, as Benius Brzezinski, who passed away two or three years ago. You know this famous sense, I'm going to give the Russians their Vietnam War, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a, an interview that he made, like, uh, maybe 15 years ago, something like that. After the observatory. Sorry? In the, the French paper, the Bell the Observatory. Mm -hmm. And he said that, I mean, the journalist was asking him, you have good references, thank you. The idea was to say, yeah, but do you regret having supported uh, the people who, are, who, would be, who would become eventually Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Of course not, I don't regret, because look, on the one hand, I have an ex religious extremist movement to deal with. It's not good, but it's under control. On the other hand, Europe is free. There is no longer something called the uh, Soviet Union. There is no this nuclear threat. I mean, at least it used to be you know, in the past. So I mean, it's a pure realistic I mean, view, according to him. So somebody like Pax would say, hey, come on, you, we have, uh, you, I mean, uh, we got rid of the Soviet Union, but now we have Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, the Middle East is in turmoil and whatever. So it's a matter of perceptions. And the thing, one of the key questions, as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, is who do you believe what? Who, what positions, what stances are made by what kind of people? For example, I'm not surprised I mean, when you know a bit about how the genesis of some foreign policy conceptions that it's more Republican affairs, I think, believing or tending to believe that Islam can be problematic. The Democrats don't like it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that when it comes to diplomacy and political practices, it's necessarily different. But the idea, the idea for example, I'll give you another example. The last uh, primary, um, uh, prior to the election of Trump, you know, this, uh, this elect the Republican um, race, you know, the... Um, Presidential race? Yes, the pres I mean, you know, within the Republican uh, Party. Yeah. Sorry? Well, the presidential primary. Yes, primary the primary election. Uh, Daniel Pach, told, once again, he told me that I was extremely happy because every single candidate mentioned the Islamism as, a, as an exist existential threat for the U.S. And I asked him, you know, do you think you, are, you have been influential? I hope so. Mm -hmm. I hope, I hope I've been. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, I mean, uh, religion is taken seriously, that's the first point, and how seriously it's, it is, you know? And I have the feeling, maybe I'm wrong, and I'd be happy to have any discussion on this issue, it is most of the time a Republican affair. Am I wrong? No? Mm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and so uh, the U.S., yeah? The but U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, uh, so I hope I, just, I, I answered your question. So the two questions, so what about the Muslim Brotherhood towards the U.S.? Well, I have edited a volume that you have uh, referred to very kindly. Um, actually, it's also extremely fascinating to discuss this issue because even the Muslim Brothers are not a an monolithic. monolithic. Of course, they're not. I mean, sociologically, we knew that. Now, I mean, we have studies, serious studies on these issues. I mean, there is no such a thing as the Muslim Brotherhood today in terms of uh, sociology, anthropology, polit polit religious beliefs, you know. Many, many, for example, Muslim brothers have turned into Salafis today. Some have joined the Sinai region. And some other, you know, are saying that we cannot afford, I mean, the time of being extremely radical has, has passed, okay? Now, when we come at the head of the state, let's say, if one day, and it was actually even before the revolution, the idea that we should consider, you know, the international system as an area of partnership and not of contending or, I mean, uh, constant, you know, uh, Contention. Antagon sorry? Contention. Contention, antagonism, whatever opposition, whatever you want. So it's something, you know, that um, it's one of the trends within the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, uh, universe today. So this sort of, so you have some people saying, for example, that uh, what about the idea of building up a caliphate or unifying the Muslims worldwide or throughout the world? Should we give up or should we reframe it or is it still a core principle in what we should believe? I mean, we still believe in this principle. And you have some people, not only among the Egyptian Muslim brothers, I'll give you an example, uh, Rashid Ranoushi in Tunisia. Now he's saying, I never, I'm not saying I have, we have to give up the calif or the unification of Muslims principle, but we should do it a peaceful way like the Europeans are building up their European Union. You know. mm -hmm. So maybe they are going to be married for, for <laughs> Arabs and Muslims in the, in the future, I don't know. But the idea is to say we do not give up when it comes to our principle, our historical principles, but we frame it differently. And you have this discourse, for example, that the U.S. is not necessarily the, the evil. 
But some people, they don't believe that. For example, the idea that the, I give you a very, very precise example, it's connected to Trump. The idea that from a Muslim Brotherhood's or Muslim Brothers perspective, we have respected democracy. We have engaged into institutionalized politics. We are pro-free elections. We have not gone to war, I mean, on the US and the West when we, when we were in power, okay? And, I mean, what have we won? And we have been tortured, we are still tortured, we are in prison, and some people here in Washington, they want to label us as a terrorist movement. So, is our moderation strategy, I don't like this word, but you understand, everybody understand what I mean, is it something efficient? Is it something relevant and worthwhile? I mean, what have we, I mean, in terms of gains, you know, what have we achieved? The idea that this, okay, because it's also politics, as you know, is something which is about values and principle. It's also about material gains and material losses. The idea, for example, that Palestine is still under occupation. The idea that the West, it's not, the West has not a problem with the Islamists. In reality, that's, I mean, I met some of them. The West has, in reality, a problem with Islam. Look at Islamophobia, look at, for example, I mean, whatever we would be doing, it would never be enough. So what the West really wants, I'm not saying that, that's what some people say are saying. I mean, they really want us to surrender. And then we find again, we, we find again the idea that Islamism to some people is an ideology of resistance. I mean, it's much more complicated, much more nuanced, much more, I mean, complex as you may imagine. But now we are, let's say, facing... Um, Let's say uh, the trend is really, I mean, to being less confident. Because the West, for example, does not help the Muslim brothers who are in prison. It was much more, let's say, positive in their views when Obama was in power. There was a huge tension. There always was a huge tension. The idea, for example, that there is a conspiracy between the US and the brothers, I could agree with them. I give me some material. I mean, I have been studying the archives. There is nothing like, hey, we are friends and we are going to manipulate the whole world and we are, well, I don't. So, so far, I think there is nothing that is, um, uh, I mean, uh, illustrating that. But with Obama, you had this idea that, okay, you, we see Ambassador Patterson, I mean, 32 times, you know, uh, Morsi and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Ambassador Patterson. So there is a connection. There is a channel of, there is an open-the-door policy, as I called it. So it means that the West can be, to a certain extent, can be trusted. So it's always like the weather news, like, you know, it's a matter of, um, from both sides. Okay. Just any idea about the moderation strategy, how would Turkey and Erdogan play into that? Because that seems like maybe one partial material success that, um, you know, he is sometimes uh, seen to be supporting political Islamist perspectives, and he's being tolerated or accepted by the U.S. From I mean, that's a win. From the brothers' perspective, yeah. Yeah. actually, actually, what we know now, years after, after the, 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 the both the revolution and the coup, is that the Turkish experience was clearly mentioned as a as a source of let's call it optimism, because the idea that not all Islamists, because we need to understand a few things. First of all, it comes from the debate an academic debate with people here at Georgetown in the think tanks, uh, Harvard, Princeton, fueling, you know, the, the many understandings that we, when it comes to political Islam, for example, Republicans, Democrats, uh, journalists, whatever. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really a debate, it's an academic discussion, and strategic discussions, okay. On the other side, you have political strategies, and what was extremely interesting at that time, Tunisia with Nahda did the same, with Ranushi, uh, Morsi did the same, not only Morsi, but the, bro the main leaders uh, at the head of, at the top of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Why should you, you the U.S., why should you fear us when you are working with Saudi Arabia, who is a religious entity I and mean, a regime? You're working with Islamists who, whose name is some Islamists whose name are, let's say, for example, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So why is it different when it comes to Egypt and the Muslim Brothers in Egypt? I'll give you a very precise example. Anne Patterson, the former ambassador, that's what she told me. She was ambassador prior to this in Pakistan, where you have Islamists. That's what she said. Well, I never, I never was 
let's say, afraid or scared of the Muslim Brothers in Egypt because it always seemed to me that they were much, much, the word was not nicer, but much more moderate than the Pakistani Islamists. The situation in Egypt, at least when she first came there, you know, when she, she was appointed, she said, well, okay, but they are pro, pro, free, uh, sorry, pro uh, free market economy. They seem to be a bit nicer than the one I used to talk to in Pakistan. And uh, in Egypt, at least there is a revolution and there is some hope. So she, w she used to see Morsi and his friends as, let's say, at least ultimately a bit more moderate than the, one she the ones she used to, to catch up with in Pakistan. So on the scale of moderation and extremism, where do you, where do you locate, I mean, for example, uh, the Egyptian Muslim brothers? Is it about Al-Qaeda? Is it closer to Al-Qaeda or closer to, uh, I don't know, uh, AKP in Turkey? And it's always, of course, changing. So the idea that politics is a matter of perception is really important. So for example, today here in the US, you have some people saying, okay, but we cannot trust them. If they had been trustworthy, there would have been no coup. The coup is interpreted, is framed as an issue connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood's ideology. If Morsi wanted to save himself, he would have been much more inclusive. That's the word you use now, today. Inclusiveness, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. The brothers, they should have been inclusive. And some other people are saying, once again, that's an ongoing debate, okay, but look, we could have ourselves, you know, be, be more supportive of Morsi, because, you know, he was doing more or less a good job. Actually, we had a transition. The situation is much worse today with CC than with Morsi. So the idea is, should we, which side, I mean, should we, uh, should we go for? So it's always a debate. And I think that one of my main, uh, let's say, um, it's still an unfinished research, but I'm not sure that the debate has really, because when I started this research, I thought that there was like huge evolutions and changings and turning points and uh, actually, no, I mean, what I have found, in, uh, I mean, by focusing on the 50s and the 60s, it was like today, today's debate. Should we trust them? Uh, I mean, how, what, what would they do? I mean, it's always, I mean, more or less the same. Perhaps there are some changes, but, you know, I'll be happy to share uh, some archives with some of you, but the idea is to say, these people, they are here, we need to deal with them, and what can we do so they can, you know, respect our agenda? and align with our own interests. That's the key question. It has not changed. Yeah. Uh, has the, did the US understanding of political Islam, Islam in Iran influence how they understood Muslim Brotherhood or vice versa? Or was it just being Sunni and Shia make US policymakers and think tanks make it seem too different? You, met, you mean the US diplomacy? Uh, well, uh, uh, in terms of how they view the Muslim Brotherhood and, and, and what they thought of Kukla Islam and how the Muslim Brotherhood behaved. In Egypt, you mean? In Egypt, yes. But did, did what they thought of Iran, how Kukla Islam manifested in Iran, influence that or what? The key, the key question, the key, let's say, um, the key thing was to consider Islamist country by country. Because, for example, when I had an interview with Queen Meccan, that's what he told me, I quickly realized, I quickly came to the conclusion that there was no such thing as a transnational political Islam. And the idea from that moment onwards was to say that, okay, we are going to have to collect some relevant data, but country by country. And when it comes eventually, you know, or possibly to have a policy towards one country, or one Islamist movement in one country, it's going to be a case by case discussion. It's going to be a case by uh, case, I mean, uh, yeah, case by case, um, I mean, issue. There is no such thing as an Islamist policy. There is a policy of engagement towards, for example, the Islamic world, which was a mistake. For example, if you talk to somebody like Peter Mendeville, he will tell you that we are not, because the thing is with Obama, that the Bush experience, the Bush mandates were extremely traumatizing. We tend to forget that. But the idea that we should go for another policy it came in a large part, I mean, it came from this, let's say, trauma, the idea that there is no such thing actually as dealing with the Islamists. We don't like their ideology, we don't like Hamas, we don't like the brothers. I, I told you, you know, because Obama was very skeptical, I mean, but the idea was to say, okay, but can we find a common, a common ground, some commonalities? So that's why this Queen Mecham Working Group, I mean, at the policy staff unit, was implemented in order, you know, to find, let's say, the policies, I mean, the 
the topics, I mean the, the questions, that could uh, make the US and the brothers, in this case, for example, work closer. So it's really something which we, sh we should forget, the idea that there was a global design, a global policy uh, linking you know, the US on the one hand and the brothers, or more generally speaking, the Islamists on the other hand. It was really a very pragmatic discussion. So we tend to, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <coughs> no, thank you. Uh, very good talk, by the way. Uh, one suggestion I would have, though, is on this exact point of, of it's kind of like the State Department's almost engagement or attempt to reach out to these Muslim Brotherhood groups, is that also under the Bush administration, they at least began this policy. If you know Amir Nakhle at the CIA, they also. Amir Nakhle? Yeah. Also I had an interview with him. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So, then it. you're aware of it. So they also actually created some of these, like, for example, I think the ambassador of the OIC, that was actually created by, or that was recommended by them before even the Obama administration. Although it wasn't really operationalized until the Obama administration. So it's true. I think there was still, although we, we don't really consider the Bush administration did at least try to somewhat engage with these ideas to a lesser extent, maybe not with clear policy, but they kind of acknowledged it. Yeah, I mean, I, as I just wanted to add, I mean, that's an important point because there's this, I mean, the Bush administration, this whole idea of like faith-based initiative, mm -hmm. I mean, they, in, the, in the U.S., they met, they started to work a lot more with Muslim, they basically included Muslim community leaders in religious, American religious discussions about mm -hmm. religion in civil society. And so I think that there's the same, maybe a sort of, Paralleling now on the in foreign policy, which is that if you're if you're going to take religion seriously as an administration, which the Bush administration was, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be prepared to reach out with these peace groups overseas. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, and, and ironically, right, we all remember the Bush administration, at least notionally, had more um, was much more open to the idea of Muslims and and Islam and Muslims as democratic forces than. Uh, many other people would be, right? I mean, he was, it's kind of ironic in the end, but I mean, he was, um, his entire Middle East policy was sort of built on the idea that uh, Muslims and, and Islam, Islam, you know, sort of want the same things that Americans do. Uh, and not necessarily just to be liberal and wear blue jeans, but to be democratic and, 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 and you know, relatively moderate, even if that means being religious and conservative. Okay. And, uh, Another uh, quick thing is, you mentioned this the question of of viewing an Islamist policy or not having that instead of viewing things by country basis. Is that, in your opinion, an extension of the Cold War? In that many still view that you know the Cold War, we almost like wherever we saw communists under our bed, we went, you know we want to go crazy, but uh, we didn't actually go country by country. See, are these Vietnamese quote unquote communists, or are they a localized? National because it seems like they're doing the opposite, in your opinion, with Muslim Brotherhood. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there are indications that they also view it as this kind of larger transnational conspiracy. When they try to compare, for example, say, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Sudan to Egypt as maybe an example of a violent group or, or another thing. That's a very, very good question, actually. Uh, according to me, there is a clear connection. Because, first of all, there is a philosophical reason for that. When we think, I mean, regardless of geopolitics or whatever, we use homologies. We do not say from political Islam and we start studying political Islam and, and that's it. So, for example, if you want to observe political Islam, it's a, very, it's a debate. The idea is, okay, but what are the similarities or the differences that we may identify or single out by a comparison with the past? I'll give you two very precise examples. I had an interview last year with Elliot Abrams, who was extremely influential, you know, uh, uh, within the, uh, the Bush administration. My question was, uh, does the Cold War framework, uh, exactly, I don't remember my, my expression, but I mean, the meaning was, um, does the Cold War experience, has it, you know, been something important in your way of dealing with the Islamists? And he said, yes, of course. The idea, you know, the debate at that time, but once again, there was not, there was, there never was something like the U.S. policy towards communism. It was never the case. Some people, for example, they were, there was a debate, I, it's very funny, there was a debate in the 70s, should we go, for example, should we work with the communists who are not, let's say, violent? And as long as they want, I mean, communists in the West, in, for example, in Western Europe. But that was a later debate. No, 70s. It started in the 70s. And you know who was the one of the main proponents in this debate? The debate that communism 
can never change because it's first a matter, first of all, first and foremost, a matter of ideology. Daniel Pipes, yeah. Thank you very much. Daniel Pipes, you're right. Yeah. Daniel Pipes' father. Richard yeah. Pipes. Richard, Richard, Richard Pipes. Yeah. Yeah. Richard Pipes. I mean, because you, you, we had a debate. How can we interpret it? How can we see communism in Stalin, in Stalin and these kind of people? Yeah, you know? earlier than no, I mean, the reaction wasn't the same. Kirkpatrick and the historians. I mean, the social school, the social explanation of, for example, communism, which was a reaction to this first, am I wrong? The idea, for example, that, okay, ideology it does matter, but communism, it's also social movements, it's also, I mean, local and different local and national experiences, and we cannot treat with or deal with communism as such, which was more, let's say, the first generation of historiography, like the idea, and do, let's remember that these people, they have a new, I mean, they have a clear Euro Eastern European background, am I wrong? So a reaction was, okay, but you essentialize communism, we are going to provide a new kind of work, you know, which we are not going to deny that communism is not ideologically strong, but we are going, you know, to enrich our understanding, you know, by focusing on sociology, on social movement theory, on, uh, I mean, critical history, critical theory, and these kind of things. Does it remind you something of something here today? The idea, for example, that, okay, you can be a Muslim, bro. can you be an Islamist and a Democrat, for example? This is a pure political science question, because it comes from something that has changed. To, I mean, empirically, we started having or witnessing some people on the ground in Tunisia, for example, Hanushi and other people, trying to, so starting to say, okay, I'm an Islamist, I still have a strong Islamic belief, I want Islam to be the pro, I mean, uh, the motto of my, my life, but I want to embrace, I mean, at least some part or the totality of the democratic, I mean, framework. So is it something that we can trust politically? And how do we study this, I mean, academically, for example? For example, I mean, once again, I, I used to, I mean, in my interview with Daniel Parks, he told me that ideology is everything. It's only, I mean, I mean, that's the main, the main, the main idea that covers, I mean, the whole debate for me. Other people would say that ideology is something that you frame on a daily basis or year after year, and it can change because we have new factors, I mean, influencing and fueling, you know, new realities. And this debate is quite similar to what we had decades ago, for example, when it comes to communism in North America or in Europe. The idea, for example, that is it a social experience or is it first and foremost ideology? That's things that we have here today. I mean, for example, uh, that's why uh, the idea, for example, that politics, political Islam is and will remain dangerous because it's a global phenomenon, like communism. As, and let's say the cure, how do you cure this so-called sickness? You nationalize Islamism. Like in the past, we used to, to do what? To nationalize the communist movements. Euro-communism, have you ever heard of the Euro-communism? Yeah. 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 Today we would say Islamo-nationalist, for example, Tunis Nahadais, first of all, is an Islamic movement with a Tunisian identity. And if you allow me to answer and to follow up on your questions, it's also an interaction. Islamists are really aware of the debates we have here in the West about them. That's why, in my view, we have, I mean, that's interesting to have this kind of debates because it has an impact, I mean, on how Islamists they see themselves and they want to introduce themselves to the rest of the world. We are Democrats, we are a new generation of Muslims, we are no longer Islamists, we are Muslim Democrats, you know? Mm -hmm. So how this diversity or diversification of categories and concepts, it what? It echoes to what? To all these debates and this growing complexity of the Islamist experience worldwide throughout the, the, the decades. Yes. Why not do that same thing though with violent groups as well? Why not have that same narrative of, well, there is a difference between Abu Sayyaf, even if it's about ISIS, Abu Sayyaf and ISIS and Al-Shabaab are very different organizations, look in a completely national context, rather than saying they're part of a global terrorism trend. Is it just because we declared war on terror in 2001 and that's it? I mean, they do view the Taliban differently, for example, in that regard, but some of the other groups, they lump them all together. Taliban were not seen as a global threat. <coughs> Taliban were seen as a threat, security threat, because of what? Not because of their, I mean, of course, they are, it's always when you want to convince people, you you highlight their ideology, the, how they treat women, and they are violent, and you know, and they, 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 they punish, I mean, uh, they punish people by hanging them, or, I mean, or okay, but, the Taliban, it's because they were the partners of the Laden and his Qaeda. That's why, that's what, that basically what the reason, the, the motivation was. So the idea that the jihadists today, they are, represent a transnational security threat, has clear implication when it comes to political Islam. The legalists, let's call it this way. 
So the idea, of, I give you a very, very interesting questions. If I am a US leader, or a European leader, and if I work with the Islamists, am I going to reinforce the non-violent side at the detriment of the jihadists, ultimately? Or am I reinforcing the jihadists because there is a continuity between them? There is a difference of <coughs> degree, not of nature, between Morsi and uh, Baghdadi, for example. So, and it's once again more or less what we have witnessed, what we used to witness actually decades ago when it came to, I mean, uh, communism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea actually, I mean, once again, I mean, and it's quite interesting because you have, even at a very individual level, you have connections between the historians who are mm -hmm. studying both topics. Yeah, as and, you mentioned. Uh, and yeah, that you can tell this is like a family history of the pipes and Gaffneys, <laughs> yeah. apparently. Frank Gaffney, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. I'm sure if there's people, you know, people might have questions afterwards. Um, Thank you very much. I and uh, thanks for more. We look forward to the book. What? Thank when, you, yeah, Thank you Jonathan. Out, Thank you for uh, putting some pressure again. Additional yeah. <laughs> pressure. I appreciate it a lot. It will come. Okay, thank you. Thank you.